In this presentation, we'll get to know an important concept that helps us think about the diversity of our thinking, so-called fast and slow thinking. To experience what we mean by this, let's start with a little activity. Stop the video maybe for a moment and read the following words out as loud as fast as possible. Now, instead of reading the words, say out loud as fast as possible in which color the following words are written. What did you notice? How was your mind working on the two different tasks differently? What, what was different? Just try to describe how it felt and what was going on. With this activity, you should have noticed that your mind was operating in two sort of different, different ways. And these two different ways of thinking have been popularized by Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he distinguishes between a system one type thinking or fast thinking, which is rather automatic and fast. It doesn't require a lot of effort. Sometimes it's often really unconscious. And this was kind of the way that we tended to do the first task where it's just about reading words. Uh, once we have learned how to read, um, it becomes quite effortless to do it. On the other hand, we have system two or slow thinking, and that requires a lot more effort, is slow and controlled, and it requires our conscious attention and also has rather small capacity, meaning we can't really do many things at once. We really have to concentrate on it. And so in this way, we can kind of a little bit sort our everyday experience, our cognitive processes along this dimension of more or less automatic and effortless, intuitive on the one hand, or concentrated, conscious, effortful on the other hand. And so, for example, reading the sentence is something that goes very quick and, and rather automatic. We can barely inhibit it. A, a reflex like removing our hand from a hot stove is something that goes very, very fast. And more towards this side of the spectrum, we might have something like counting how many letters T are in this sentence. So here we'll really have to stop and stop, start counting, and we can't really be distracted by many other things. And so also things like solving certain math problems, like for two plus, plus two, this goes very, very quickly, immediately the number four jumps up in our mind versus a task like 13 times 46. There also we have to stop everything we're doing and really take the time and it's very effortful to do the calculation. And so on it goes with many other uh, examples that we can come up with to help us practice noticing and sorting this kind of different ways of thinking that we're actually using in our everyday life. Here's then a full lesson plan for these kinds of activities that help students practice and, and notice this kind of difference between fast and slow thinking. Now, again, because we're talking about these are kinds of human behaviors, we, we could again ask what, we keep, what could be the reasons or the causes that your brain is able to do some things effortlessly while other things take a lot of effort. We can ask then also questions like what might be the role of our evolutionary history or of genes and what might be the role of experience and learning try to answer these questions a little bit in your own mind. One way to help us think about what might be the role of learning, experience, evolutionary past is this metaphor, the highway analogy. So we can think of our fast and automatic system one more like a kind of highway where we can get from A to B very quickly and efficiently. But on the other hand, we're also not very flexible. And highways often also derive from historic paths and roads between major cities. So there's a role of history. The longer a 
path or a road is traveled traveled in the past, the more it, be, it tends to become then a, a faster, bigger, efficient highway. On the other hand, the slow, effortful system too is kind of like a new trail. We can take a new path to get to a new destination, but we're also not making fast progress. It's pretty slow. We really have to create the path in the first place. But then again, the more often people might take this path, the faster it can become a wider and drivable path. So this is how we can think about how something that is slow and effortful at the beginning, over time, both in evolutionary history and in our uh, individual development, it can become something of a fast thinking process. And this, this kind of idea relates really a little bit to some aspects of neurobiology, the way that neurons really make connections and create faster and faster connections over our learning history. Another question that we can ask is, do you think we humans come to the world with a couple of highways already in our brain when we are born? Or is our brain more like a blank slate without any connections and that all the connections get made through our individual experience? This is actually a very important uh, research question. And so cognitive scientists and developmental psychologists, they're really trying to understand what kind of highways or connections are really in our brain early in our development and how does our learning experience shape those kinds of connections. Another model that we can use to make sense of these questions and to also again help us notice different processes in our mind and how they might be connected to the past, to our evolutionary past, is the so-called triune brain model. This is again a very simplified way to understand the different functions of our mind or our brain. But even though it's very simplified, it can still be helpful a helpful tool to help us become aware and sort these different experiences. So the triune brain distinguishes basically between three kinds of brain areas that have certain functions. First, the so-called reptilian brain. Um, this is this consists of the evolutionary oldest parts of our brain. And so its role is the regulation of body functions. It performs reflexive and instinctive actions such as the fight or flight response. It's also kind of autopilot that things that happen without our conscious control or flexibility. And so actions like pulling our hand from a hot surface, reflex like actions, they are they are being uh, kind of executed by this reptilian brain areas. Then on top of it is the mammalian brain, the limbic system is part of this, and this is a little bit younger in evolutionary terms. Its role is the processing of information from the body, emotions, evaluations, also creating social bonds, uh, places where memories are, and so it is a little bit more flexible, but still very hardly con consciously controllable by us. And so its role is um, when we're making intuitive decisions or when we are reacting emotionally to certain, uh, especially social situations. And then finally, we have the primate brain. This is the, the cortex, the top layer of the brain. This is where the place is for language and abstract thoughts, logical thinking and conscious awareness. And so it tends to be also the most flexible and we can more or less control it through conscious guidance of our attention. And for example, its role is for us to be able to solve tasks like 12 times 27 and so on, or to suppress um, reactions that are coming from the other parts of the brain, for example, our suppressing our emotions in a particular situation. And again, it's a very simple model. All of these things are interacting con uh, constantly. And it's also, of course, a simplification that this is the primate brain, the mammalian brain and the reptilian brain, because there's, of course, also reptiles and birds that have 
sometimes these areas and also other species, not just primates, have a cortex. So here are just some homework ideas for you to practice noticing fast and slow thinking in your everyday life. Try to sample your everyday experience by becoming aware in a moment um, yeah, when are you using system one or system two, or you can also use the try and brain model to be aware of what kind of functions is your mind currently doing. You could also estimate how much of a day of a day your mind is actually doing slow thinking. Even one could ask, does this question even make sense? Does it actually make sense that we're either just doing slow thinking or fast thinking, or is it maybe more the case that we're doing all of those things at once a little bit? You can also come up with more examples for fast thinking and slow thinking from your everyday experience. And we can also reflect on um, the question, if we know that fast thinking uh, is the result of a lot of experience over time, we can ask ourselves, well, what kind of tasks are maybe difficult for us to do and based on what we have learned about the role of system one and system two, what could we do so that one day it might become easier and less effortful for us to do. Here's a fun little video which kind of shows you pretty well the role of fast and slow thinking and how they interact and operate when we have to learn new things. You can also find the transcript and discussion guide in this document. Thank you.